In this message, we look at some practical aspects of worshipping God when we are alone and also collectively as a congregation. Before we make our declaration, let's turn to Proverbs chapter 21, 23. It says, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Okay, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Soul, we know, refers to our mind, our will, our emotions, right? So whoever guards, whoever is careful about what they speak, in other words, you know, we actually guard our emotions, okay? So if you're, if you're in a foul mood this morning, just check and ask yourself, what have I been speaking? What have I been confessing? If you're feeling low, just do that quick check. Because scripture says that whenever we guard our mouth and tongue, we keep our soul from troubles, our imagination, our mood, our emotions, they are affected by the words we speak. So here, this verse talks about us being affected negatively. Right? But what would happen if we take the truth of God's word and we intentionally speak, confess, declare the word of God. You know, and that's what we see in, um, if you turn to 3 John and verse 2, it says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So there's a connection between our emotions, what we think, our imagination, and the words that we speak. So we are called to make our soul prosper. And when our soul prospers, when our thoughts, our imaginations, uh, our emotions, when they prosper, they affect all areas of our lives. So he says, be in health and prosper just as your soul prospers. So let's confess the word of God. Let's take the truth of the word of God and confess it intentionally over our lives. Amen? All right. So why don't we lift our Bibles and stand up and make our declaration. Just remember this, that when we speak, you know, our soul prospers. Whatever we declare affects our emotions. So let's declare the truth. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I am saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I am a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive his word, I believe his word, and I live by his word. Christ is my master, and to him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Shake hands with your neighbor and say, may your soul prosper. Amen. We're continuing with our um, sermon series on worship. And uh, this Sunday is going to be the second of the, uh, of the four-part uh, four messages. I think we, we looked at um, understanding worship last Sunday. We looked at some of the foundations of worship, right? We saw that everybody worships, whether they believe in God or not. Everybody worships. The object of worship is very different from people to people. But when you look at the Word, we see that worship is actually a recognition of who God is. Worship is reverence unto God, deep respect unto God. Worship is also communion with God, that it's not superficial, it's deep, intimate exchange of feelings and emotions. It's communion with God. And uh, we also saw that worship is our response to an encounter with God, right? And then we saw uh, what the Lord Jesus, when he, when he had this in, uh, conversation with the woman at the well, what he said about worship, his thoughts on worship. He said, the Father is seeking 
worshippers and the true worshippers will worship the father in spirit and in truth so we saw that that we need to worship with all our heart out of our spirit as led by the spirit of god and in truth meaning without any pretense without any hypocrisy uh without um you know in truth which means uh, as prescribed by the word of god because the word of god is truth and then we saw what happens when we worship we don't add anything to god just by worshiping god doesn't become bigger just because of our worship but something definitely happens to us when we worship we see that we are changed when we worship god we are empowered to rule and reign when we worship god and so many other things we saw that there's transformation when we worship god we experience the presence of god when we worship him and lastly we looked at worshiping god in difficult times we saw that you know it doesn't depend on our emotions it doesn't depend on our moods because moods can swing emotions can go up and down right even though we use our emotions in worship we are not controlled by emotions in worship right we're not led by emotions so we saw that we can worship god in difficult times and we looked at some examples from the word we looked at abraham we looked at david and we looked at paul and silas how in the most difficult of times they chose to recognize who god was they chose to revere god they chose to commune with god and today we're going to look at uh, personal worship and corporate worship okay uh, turn to your neighbor and say you are a priest okay i can see some people not turning to their neighbors you know you are a priest okay uh, so this truth will will unfold but before we get into that you know we need to see that worship is also an offering of sacrifice to god it's not only recognition reverence communion and our response to who he is but it's also an offering of sacrifice to god and when we read about the tabernacle in the book of exodus uh god gives detailed instructions to moses about what should be done how the tabernacle should be and very detailed instructions and in the book of leviticus we 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 read some more about how these sacrifices should be offered how it should be uh, done in a certain way great detail right so uh, let's look at the tabernacle the tabernacle itself you know it's um it's a big tent and this is how it is uh, we see the the altar of burnt offerings we see the bronze laver that's in what is called the outer court then we move to the next section which has the table of showbread lampstand altar for burning incense and then the uh, the holy of holies which is the um, you know the most holy place it's called and and so on okay so we look at the first part which is the outer court we see there's a altar for burnt offerings and also there is a bronze laver laver which is basically a, a a huge vessel filled with water right so god gave these instructions detailed uh, instructions for how he should be worshiped and instituted this in the wilderness so the priest would come so just picture this that you are there at the tabernacle so you enter and then if you are a priest you would wash you know ceremoniously your hands your feet in that bronze laver and then you would move to the altar of sacrifice and the animal or the bird which was already sacrificed which was already killed outside the tent would be brought in it would be kept on the altar in a certain way it will be uh, you know chopped in a certain way it will be kept there prepared in a certain way and the blood of the sacrifice would be placed on the altar around the altar and the offering would be burnt right so that is what would happen at the altar of sacrifice there could also be grains placed there all kinds of offerings burnt offering sin offering trespass offering peace offering thanksgiving and so on so this was done and then you move on to the next place next section which is the holy place and uh, here we have the table of showbread which is representing the 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 bread of life and god actually supplying for our spiritual needs our physical needs 
and also healing and deliverance and so on. The lampstand representing the work of the Holy Spirit, the revelatory work, the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. And then the altar of incense, which, is, um, which represents prayer and intercession. And beyond that curtain which you see there, only one person could go there, and uh, one designated person. And he is the high priest. And he could not go in there any time, but just once a year. And he goes in there, and in that section, which is called the most holy place or the holy of holies, we have the Ark of the Covenant, and on top of it is the mercy seat. And you have uh, the two cherubims there with wingtips touching each other. And there, he would experience the presence of God. God would speak from among the cherubim, from the middle of the cherubim. So the priest would do all this, the high priest would enter in and experience the presence of God. Okay. It's interesting to see that in the book of Hebrews, it says that all this was symbolic. All this was symbolic. Symbolic of the present times. The sacrifice itself, symbolic of that perfect sacrifice, of that blood which would be shed, talking about the Lord Jesus. Right? So the perfect sacrifice. We read about it in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 9. It says, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. But Christ came as high priest of good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. In other words, Hebrews 10, verse 11 and 12, it says, Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. Why? Because these can never take away sins. Verse 12, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So this sacrifice, the tabernacle, everything was symbolic of what, that perfect sacrifice, the Lord Jesus himself. That perfect, that sinless blood that was shed, the Lord Jesus. So we, we see that it's symbolic of that perfect sacrifice. There's no requirement for any other sacrifice now because of that perfect sacrifice. Okay. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 22, it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So what does this tell us? It says that, yes, the tabernacle is symbolic, the sacrifice is symbolic of the truth, of the real thing. And secondly, we as believers, we have access to the very presence of God. At a time when the, only the high priest could go and experience God's presence once a year, we as believers, it says here, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, he says, let us draw near. Each one of us, let us draw near. And when we draw near as individuals in response to this invitation, when we draw near to him because of that sacrifice, when we draw near to him in assurance of faith, when we draw near with boldness, we call it personal worship. Amen. So this morning, I just want to encourage us, you know, that sacrifice was done, that price was paid. There's no need for us to stay at the outer courts. We have access to God. No matter what we've done, that sacrifice has taken away. It was that perfect sacrifice.
The priest had to go again and again because things would not change. His life would not change. He knows that he would have sinned. And that blood of goats and calves would not take away sin. But that sinless blood, that sacrifice has taken away the sins of the world. And so the invitation for each one of us, let us draw near. Let us draw near. Let us draw near in worship. Let us draw near in confidence. Let us draw near putting our faith in what Christ has done on the cross. You focus on that. and Say, Lord, this is what, you, what you've done for me. This is what you did for me. So I'm drawing near in worship. So I'm coming to you in worship. So don't stay far away. Don't say, don't be inhibited by, you know, your own consciousness of sin or things that you've missed. Draw near. Because we draw near not based on our performance, but based on what He has done. Amen. Right. It says, let's draw near with boldness, of course. And it says, with a true heart. When we draw near to Him, we draw near in spirit and in truth, with our whole heart, a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So here are some practical things as we draw near. You know, if our conscience bothers us as we draw near to God, the right thing to do is to go before Him and say, God, I'm sorry, I missed it here, here, and here. I missed it, God. And so clear that conscience and draw before him with a clear conscience. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, If we are faithful, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. If we confess, he is faithful to forgive us of all unrighteousness. So we confess, he is faithful. Clear our conscience, let's go before him. But let's put our faith in the finished work of Christ. Because he has given us, he has clothed us with his righteousness. So we draw near to him, not based on our right stand, not based on our righteousness, but the righteousness that he gives us. Many times when we fall, you know, going to God and worship is the last thing we want to do, right? We want to massage our conscience till we feel okay. Emotionally, we feel okay, and then we just crawl and, and then go. No, no, but the scripture says, hey, that sacrifice was made, that perfect sacrifice. So you draw near, you draw near. So that invitation, that exhortation, that encouragement, let us draw near. Let us draw near in worship. Some things that we can do as we draw near to God and being aware of what he has done for us on the cross, no matter what you know, we're going through, draw near to him and express thanksgiving. Give thanks to Him. You know, I'm sure that in a day, there could be at least one thing that we are thankful for. Yes or no? At least one thing. Can we just give thanks to Him and say, Oh God, I thank you. I thank you that I'm alive. I thank you. So let's draw near to Him with thanksgiving. Let's draw near to Him with praise. Let's praise Him for who He is. Let's draw near. And yes, as we draw near, here's something that we can do you know, in personal worship, we can worship Him with the Word, with the Word of God. Um, if you can turn to Psalm 36 and uh, verse 5, Psalm, we can use several texts. You know, sometimes we have this question, okay, I've drawn near, what do I do now? You know, what do I do? What do I say? Psalm 36, it's scripted here, verse 5. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like great mountains. So use that as a script. Open the word and say, O God, your mercy, it extends to the heavens. I draw near to you and I draw near with, with a grateful heart. I give thanks to you. I give thanks to you that I can see this, that I can read this. And you, O God, your mercy, it is in the heavens. Right. Worship is not what we do like this. On Sunday, not only what we do together, but it's what we do alone when we draw near to Him. So, the script is here. There's so many, uh, you know, instances where the psalmist is worshiping, and we can use those words as well. Okay, let's turn to Psalm 104 
and verse 1 bless the lord o my soul o lord my god you are very great you are clothed with honor and majesty you cover yourself with light as with a garment who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and so on and as we actually read out and say oh god your mercies as the high as the heavens your faithfulness reaches to the clouds our mind you know in our mind we are reminded the holy spirit reminds us of those times when we experience the mercy of God. The Holy Spirit reminds us of those times when we experience the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, the great, greatness of God. And so we read out and we worship it. And sometimes songs just come, right? You don't want to just speak it out. You want to sing it out. Your mercy, oh God. You know, you sing it out and say, oh God, it extends to the heavens. That's something that we can do. And of course, we can pray, we can speak and sing in tongues. Sing out in tongues. I've run out of words, God. You know, the psalmist says, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my Redeemer's praise. And sometimes we're just saying, oh, God, I've run out of words. Just start praying, praising him in tongues. It's a valid expression, you know, in the spirit, right? Praying in tongues, singing in tongues, sing out in tongues. So this is what we do as we draw near to him in worship. We do it on our own in our personal time, not just together as a church, on our own, in our homes, wherever we are. Okay. The other thing that we see is that our identity as new creations, our identity as believers, there's another aspect of that identity, and that is we are priests unto God. Amen. So turn to your neighbor and say, you are a priest. Where is your robe? <laughs> you know, immediately we think of robes, we think of uh, attire. But hello, you and I are clothed with righteousness. Amen. And you, are, we and, I, you, and, you and I, we are priests unto God. And you and I are clothed with garments of praise. He has clothed us. You know, before the tabernacle, the Lord gave elaborate uniform or attire for the priests. This is what you wear, the fabric, linen, trousers, and so on, headgear. Today, we are clothed with righteousness, and righteousness not of ourselves, but that comes from Him. We are clothed with garments of praise. So we draw near, and we, we know that we are priests. 1 Peter 2 and verse 5, this is what it says. It says, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Let me read that again. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, which means that just like the priests of the tabernacle, when they came, they offered up sacrifices. We as worshipers and priests in the new covenant, we have a responsibility as priests. A priest doesn't just attend service, yes or no. A priest doesn't just attend meetings. A priest has a role. A priest has a responsibility. And you and I are priests unto God. Which means that we have a role, we have a responsibility to offer up sacrifices. But we cannot offer any more sacrifice because that perfect sacrifice was already offered. Right? So to go to the Holy of Holies, that sacrifice is already done. So what sacrifice do we offer? The Bible says we offer spiritual sacrifices. Spiritual sacrifices. We don't come with a dead animal or a dead bird. But we offer up spiritual sacrifices. And the Bible talks about spiritual sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15 says, Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So he says, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise, giving thanks. So I hope that makes us look at the praise that we bring before God in a different light. In spirit and truth, in boldness, when we draw near, and we come and offer our praise to God, our thanksgiving to God, it goes before Him as a spiritual 
sacrifice. Amen. Hallelujah. So when we, when we gather together or when we are alone, as priests, we are offering up spiritual sacrifices every time we praise God. Every time we look at the word and just read out and say, God, you are great. You are awesome, God. When we mean it from our hearts, we are offering up a sacrifice, a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to him through Christ, and that is praise. So what is praise? Can you turn to your neighbor and say something complimentary to them? You know, it could be about, okay, probably soon we have to, uh, you're a very patient father. So I see. Okay. Okay. If you, just turn to your neighbor. It could be your wife. It could be your husband. It's okay. A compliment today. <laughs> Come on. Done? Okay. Uh, be a little generous with your compliment. <laughs> Don't stop with just one thing. Maybe a couple of things, you know. Right? So, what you did, just did to commend, to... Uh, to applaud, you know, in other words, to say something nice, to compliment. It's a simple case of praise. We observe something and we praise. You know, if you're sitting next to a neighbor, most likely you'll just say, uh, you know, what you're wearing is good. That's it. You're looking good. But if you're sitting to someone whom you know, you know, you know I saw Sunu and is uh, with a little one running around, very patient. So I said, so you're a very patient father. When you know someone, you'll say something more. Right? So that's the same with God. With relationship, your praise changes. So praise is just to applaud, to commend, to uh, express approval, admiration. Here's the thing. Praise is verbal declaration. You know, if you just thought about it and did not say it out, the other person never gets to hear about it. Praise is always verbal. It is to be declared or to be displayed. In a sense, if I'm not able to, if I'm unable to speak, if I have that inability, then I display it, I express it, I show it. It is to be declared, it is to be displayed. So praise is not praise if it is just within my heart. So the point is this. You know, when we want to praise God, we need to open for praise to happen. Amen. We need to open our mouths. We need to say it out. We need to declare it. Because praise is verbal. It's a verbal adoration. It is the spiritual sacrifice that we offer to God. So we offer to God this praise. You know, it, the Bible talks about the sacrifice of praise. The verse before that we read is before. Just come before him and um, offer the sacrifice of praise to God. Now, praise involves sacrifice. There is a cost. You know, sacrifice is uh, giving up something uh, that you have a right to or taking on something that you don't have to. Sacrifice. Sacrifice also means death to certain things. Uh, maybe there is a death to comfort. You, know, you say, I've never opened my mouth and praised. Doesn't God know it already? Of course he does. But praise is verbal. So that there's a death to the way I've done things. This is how I do it. There's a death to that. There's a death to pride. You know, we look at, when we look at the expressions of pra praise, we see that there is a death to that as well. No, there is a death to our ego. There is a death to our self-pity at times. We are so wrapped up in ourself, uh, what things happen to us, and we are unable to take the focus off ourself and onto God. Now, praise puts a death to that. Right? So, you we turn our focus. There is a death to that focus on ourselves, and we focus on God. Because praise is a verbal adoration of who God is and what he can do. So there is a death to focusing on self. So praise involves sacrifice. And in the Hebrew language, the word praise, you know, it's, it's so rich. There are many Hebrew words which talk about praise. And, and probably, you know, some of us are 
aware of that and it will be just a repetition but uh, let's go that go over that you know together um, there's another there's a word called yada which means to praise god with extended hands yada right there's another word toda which means to praise god with extended hands and to thank him for things that we've not yet received also to thank him for things that we have received and to thank him for things that we have not yet received so we extend our hands we thank him there's another word halal which means to rave about to boast about to be excited about halal okay so it's not quiet is it it's not quiet you're boasting about you know if you've uh, watched football when the when the somebody who scores a goal does he walk around with hands in his pocket mm i scored his goal no way he's running and the thing is he's doing certain things which are foolish right he's running he's skidding across the field he's probably taken his t-shirt and he's you know he's, he's covered his face with it and the, the 10 others are also doing the same thing they're jumping they are doing somersault they are excited they are celebrating if you're not a fan of football let's do a cricket example <laughs> you know how many of you seen imran tahir south africa you know bowling taking a wicket what does he do he just starts running and the other team members they run after him he's not running towards them he's running everywhere but away from them so we see that picture there halal to be excited about to rave about to boast about and if we look at the verse where it's used then the meaning comes out even more right let's look at psalm 22 and uh, Psalm 22 and verse 23, uh, 22 and 23, right? Um, Psalm 22 says, uh, verse 22, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. The word used there is halal. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. Verse 23, all who fear the Lord, praise him. All your descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. So what is they are saying here I will I will praise you in the assembly I will rave about you I will boast about you I will be foolish I will do certain things excitedly I will do it in the assembly it says I won't I don't care you know in the football match there's some I don't know 40,000 50,000 watching they don't care they're celebrating there's a small number here but when we praise the lord in the assembly we are actually getting excited about him and that word halal brings that meaning there's another word shabak which means a shout of praise oh this gets even better right? shout of praise shout of triumph you know if we thought that church worship or worship of our living god is quiet we are wrong we have those moments when we are when we need to be still and know that he is god and how could we read you know the lord is in his temple let all the earth keep quiet before him yes there are those moments but when it comes to the word praise we see that it's extravagant it's extroverted and by the way it doesn't depend on our personality amen you know i've heard comments like it um this church is probably for young people it's not for old people why you know the the time of singing is boisterous or you know sometimes but the thing is it doesn't depend on our personality type or whether we are young or whether we are whether we are old because halal is biblical hello amen and from that we get the word hallelujah shabak shabak or to shout in triumph to hilla songs of praise barak to kneel down to bow down in adoration zama to make music to sing songs accompanied by musical instruments so far it was a cappella but now it's music together with song so it's very extroverted it has to be declared it has to be displayed it's not based on our feelings i think we saw that last sunday it's a choice that we make it's a decision that we make um the psalmist says in um, psalm 42 and verse 5 why are you cast down o my soul 
And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Psalm 34 verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So what the psalm is saying is, I will, I shall. You know, these are decisions. These are choices. He's saying, you know, my feelings could be up and down, but I will. Because it's not based on who I am, but it's based on who God is. So I will praise him. This, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. So how should we praise God? Or where should we praise God? When can we praise him? At all times, all places. We're not confined to anything, a place or a time. Anytime we can praise him. And how should we praise him? You know, scripture gives several um, examples of how to praise him. This applies to us when we draw near to him as priests, as priests offering uh, spiritual sacrifices alone, or as a company of priests when we gather together in worship, right? Biblical expressions of praise. The first one is proclamation or spoken words. It is not just singing, but are speaking. And we can use scriptures to do this. Psalm 26 and verse 7 says, that I may proclaim him with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all your wondrous works. So we, we just proclaim, we start speaking, we directing, we start directing our proclamation, our declarations towards God. That's expression of our praise to God. Then of course, the most common one that we know is singing. Psalm 47 and verse 6 says, Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. So what happens when we sing? You know, there's a, it's like we go into second gear, right? We add some emotions and we are able to actually mean what we're singing. You know, we can, you know, we can speak words of love, Probably we would have done that when you were growing up or even now. But we can also sing words of love. So you ask the recipient, which was better? You know, probably at times the spoken words, probably at times the sing, what you sing, right? We add emotions when we sing. So singing, we sing praise to God. Psalm 47 and verse 1 says, Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. So clapping our hands is to show our, um, uh, uh, show our appreciation. We clap hands to applaud, to appreciate, to cheer. So when we clap hands, we are actually cheering who God is, what he has done for us. We appreciate. Right? So many times when we clap hands, uh, we, 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 we do it in time with the music, right? Um, this is the day, this is, you know, we do it in time with the, hand, you know, the music. And, but this here we see it is actually to applaud God. Clapping hands in time with the music is fine, but we clap hands when we applaud and we praise Him. Hallelujah. How many of you have never clapped hands and praised God? All of you? I don't believe you. <laughs> okay, can we all clap hands, put down your Bibles, and can we just... God, we just thank you for who you are, God. We bless your name. We appreciate all that you've done, God. You are that perfect sacrifice, oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, feel free to clap hands. You know, in this church, you have the freedom. Because it's there in the word. Amen. If anyone says, you know, tone it down a bit, don't clap hands, just show them from the word. Psalm 47 verse 1, okay. Hello, it's there. Clap hands to God. Show your appreciation. So anytime, you know, the truth of God hits home. The God gives you a revelation. Just don't hold back. 
Clap hands and let's praise him. Another valid expression of praise is shouting. Whoa, dangerous territory. Supposed to be reverential. Yes, the reverential one, the one who's worthy of reverence, has put down in scripture that we can shout joyfully. Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and say, shout joyfully. Come on. You know, Psalm 66 and verse 1 says, Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Saying, make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. And of course, 47 and 1, we saw it all the Shout to God with a voice of triumph. You know, shouting. We're overcome with the revelation. We're overwhelmed with the revelation of who God is. And we shout out. And it has some spiritual connotation as well. You know, when we read, we read that in, um, in, uh, in the book of Joshua, at the, at the wall that, uh, that came down, God told him, right, this is what you do. You go around it seven days, seven times, and on the last day, you go around it seven days. On the seventh time, you shout out. You shout. And what happened? The walls came down. Now, we know that whatever happened in the Old Testament is a shadow of the real thing. So as New Testament believers, you know, there is a spiritual impact when we shout. Strongholds come down when we shout. Amen. Hallelujah. So there is a time and place for that. Right? When we are doing God, be still and know that's not the time to shout. There is a time, but let's flow with that and shout. Don't hold back. You have scriptural, you know, authority to shout and praise. We also praise God by lifting of our hands. I think that's very common. We do that. But, um, you know, I found it very difficult from the church background that I come from, uh, you know, a CSI background. Because we had something always in our hands. We had either the hymn book or the, you know, the, the other book. And uh, I'm just joking. But then we never, I found it very difficult to, you know, raise my hands lift my hands. I found it difficult, right? Uh, it took a while. But lifting of hands is a sign of surrender. Okay. The, the, pole, the, the cops, you know, they don't come and if somebody points a gun at you, they don't say, fold your hands. Because that's a very defensive posture. They say, put your hands up. Which means you're vulnerable. The boxer never goes like this in front of the opponent. It's a sure sign that in the next few seconds, there'll be a knockout, right? He always puts his hand in front because it's a defensive posture. And when we put our hands to God, we're saying, God, I surrender. I surrender. When we put our hands to God, we're saying, God, I reach out to receive all that you're giving me. When we put our hands to God, we're saying, oh, God, I, I'm just reaching out to you. I receive, I reach out to you. I surrender. You know, um, this picture is actually very fresh in my mind. I remember when my daughter was, uh, I think, four or five, and, or maybe less than that. Uh, we went to have ice cream. It was a simple chocolate uh, cup. But she was so small. And as I was giving her that ice cream, you know, there was such joy in her eyes, in her face. And she was just reaching out to me. She was literally jumping with joy. She was reaching out. I have that picture very fresh in my mind. And you know what? When I saw that, I was excited as well. So here's the thing. When we reach out to God, He is excited. He is responding with joy. There's so much joy. It was a simple act. It was just a simple ice cream. Maybe she was more excited about ice cream. It's okay. But it warmed my heart to see that. Lifting our hands. We, expression of praise, again, playing of musical instruments, Psalm 33 and verse 2 and 3 says, Praise the Lord with a harp, make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings, sing to him a new song, play skillfully with a shout of joy. So when we play instruments, when we play as unto the Lord, when we play it as unto the Lord, it's an expression of praise. He says, Pray, play skillfully and, and praise him. So we use instruments, but we should not become, become dependent on instruments like for our worship. Oh, there's no drums today, worship. I don't know yet. 
or you know the keys is not there i don't feel it right we we don't have to become dependent we use instruments to to express our praise to god our worship to god okay so we went through six there's four more singing and speaking in tongues is a valid expression as long as you do it unto god by yourself or in a in a group of people you're doing it unto god right uh, it is between you and god acts chapter 10 uh, peter when he goes and uh, to cornelius house and uh, there the gentiles are filled with the spirit the scripture says that they spoke in tongues they heard them speak with tongues and magnify god same thing happens in acts chapter 2 as well 2 and verse 11 they spoke in tongues and the others actually recognized that they were praising god in their language so we know speaking in tongues is speaking an earthly language it could also be a heavenly language so when we pray in tongues we magnify god when we speak in tongues we can sing out in tongues as well standing when we stand up why do we stand standing is a sign of respect standing is a sign of respect standing is also a sign that we are alert to god dancing Psalm 149 and verse 2 says let Israel rejoice in their maker let the children of Zion be joyful in their king let them praise his name with the dance okay wow that's a challenge right now if you're thinking about moonwalk and choreograph steps you know think again right here the word is twirling with joy there's a word called jeel which we read in ephesians i'm sorry uh, zephaniah 3 and verse 17 talks about god rejoicing over us with singing god rejoicing over us and what does he do that word rejoice there means to spin around in excitement spin around if god can do that over us we can express in dance as well and maybe that's an area that we need to grow into uh, yes choreograph steps have have a place in uh, declaring the glory of god but it needn't be that all the time it's just jumping up and down for joy that's my dance you twirl around and dance before him praise him uh kneeling bowing down and prostrating these are also we saw in um um last sunday psalm 95 verse 6 talks about you know come before him uh let's let's read psalm 95 and verse 5 psalm 95 very interesting psalm which talks about different postures of worship okay psalm 95 and verse 5 um verse 6 actually let us worship and bow down let us kneel before the lord our maker for he is our god and we are the people of his pasture and so on If you read from verse 1 onward it says let us sing to the lord let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation let us come before her presence with thanksgiving let us shout joyfully and then it goes on to say let us worship let us bow down let us kneel down before him so see all these expressions of worship this becomes meaningless if our heart is not engaged in it yes or no yes it becomes empty if our heart is not engaged in it so for our for us to be engaged in expressing praise to god in this manner we need to get a revelation of who god is a revelation and revelation for revelation we need a relationship so with that relationship we get a revelation from god because he is more than willing to show more of himself and that gives us conviction to go ahead and express to go ahead and express praise to god remembering being reminded that when we do that it is an offering of spiritual sacrifice to him which is our role which is our responsibility as the holy priesthood amen okay so we won't look down on people because they don't lift their hands we won't look down on people because they don't dance but it's an encouragement for all of us to grow into this it's an encouragement for all of us to uh, grow 
in more of this. So what happens when we praise God? When we praise God, He is enthroned in our praise. The Bible says that He is enthroned in the praises of His people, which means the king who is on the throne, He influences His kingdom. The king is on the throne. He is enthroned in our praise. So he invades, his kingdom invades our circumstance. His kingdom invades our situation. When we praise him, when we praise him, he causes divine deliverance. Second Chronicles 20 and verse 22 says, When they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah. Because King Jehoshaphat, he did something very, very radical. He put a worship team in front of the army. I'm sure people would have laughed. You know, when we praise God unreservedly, it actually attracts ridicule. You know, why are you so excited about it? It attracts ridicule. It attracts questions. But he did that. And the Bible says that God set up ambushes and there was divine deliverance. Praise stops the enemy. Psalm 8 verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Praise also prepares our heart to receive from God. You know, many times we come to church and we're not in a position to receive from him. We're not in the frame of mind to receive from him. Coming to church itself was a big adventure. Reaching church was a big challenge. You know, parents with children, you know, right? Getting everything ready, come, and reaching itself is a big accomplishment. So we're not in any frame of mind to receive. But praise, you know, uh, Hosea 10 and verse 11 says, Judah shall plow, which means like praise tills our heart. So, you know, the soil of our heart is tilled to receive from him. So praise prepares our heart to receive from God. So when we do this as a congregation, you know, when we come before him with no other agenda, maybe the agenda is not to receive from him, but the agenda is to give to him the sacrifice of praise. You know, when we do that, God accepts, he receives praise. And in the act of receiving, we experience his presence. In the Old Testament, we see that. They built the altar. They placed the sacrifice. God graced us with his fire. There was fire from above. There was fire from the rock. But there was something that God did to receive that. So when we come together as a church, and with our in spirit, in truth, we come and offer this sacrifice of praise to him. And when he receives it, we experience the presence of God. So the congregation experiences the presence of God and, and also the songs that we sing together, you know, it reinforces truth. We sing songs of um, uh, Scripture, Colossians 3 and verse 16 says, Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So, Several things happen when we come together as a church and offer our sacrifice of praise to God. We also learn to express praise and worship uninhibitedly, right? See, all of us come from different church backgrounds, maybe very traditional, very conservative. And for us, expression of praise and worship, in all sincerity, it meant being silent. And there is truth to that. But... In Scripture, there's so much more. When we praise Him, we see all these are valid expressions, right? So I want to challenge us, encourage us, you know, make a choice. Today, I'm going to lift my hands, you know, next Sunday when you come. Today, I'm going to dance before the Lord. I'm going to clap my hands to the Lord. I'm going to shout out, shout a victory to the Lord. Amen, right? So... You know, Tim Hawkins, the Christian comedian, he talks about times when people just come and there's no lifting of hands. They just put their hands in their pocket and stand. And there are some who are bold enough, they put their fingers in the loop of the belt and then they flap their hands like that. And there are some who are bolder and they do this. They do this. He calls it carrying the TV. 
and sometimes it's big, big screen. <laughs> and then he talks about, you know, several other expressions, but, you know, he just makes fun of what is happening in church, what he sees, you know, changing the light bulb, washing the window, <laughs> touchdown, you know, all these things, maybe we can call it sixer. But the thing is this, that in all reverence, right, uh, we're not trivializing God in any way. In all holiness, because the holy God, the one who's worthy of reverence, has put it there that we can express our praise in this manner. So let's grow in it. Let's challenge ourselves and say, you know, you know as God gives me that revelation, as I intentionally draw near to him in worship as a priest to God, I'm going to offer this sacrifice of praise to him. Some attitudes, you know, really hinder pride, right? Hey, I'm too dignified for this. Then you look at David, oh, the king, the ruler of a nation, dancing unashamedly before God. So pride, irreverence at times, you know, when we don't come before him with respect and honor, that's a hindrance. Another attitude could be, uh, you know, spectatorism. We come before him and I just want to, you know, just watch what is happening. I'm a spectator. I want to hear the singing. Uh, there's nothing wrong being in that place, but we are called to draw near. We are called to come from the outer court, move in right to the Holy of Holies. Because the way has been made. Amen? Right. Maybe sentimentalism. Oh, this song, you know, we used to do this over in those days. Those were the good old days. And we are getting very nostalgic about the song. We're getting very sentimental about the song. But we've lost our focus of the truth that the song is actually about. Uh, it could be merely paying lip service. Mere lip service. And, you know, when you say praise the Lord or hallelujah over and over. And maybe you don't mean it. You know, uh, it's a hindrance because our heart is not engaged. You know, sometimes people call and say uh, over the phone, you know, praise the Lord, brother. And you don't know who it is, right? And, and you also say praise the Lord, but you're saying praise the Lord, you know, praise the Lord, question mark. It's not praise the Lord, exclamatory. You know, they said praise the Lord, brother, praise the Lord, sister. And you're saying praise the Lord. And that praise the Lord is not really praising the Lord. It's like, who are you? You know, many times, you know, we use Christianese. You know, we say praise the Lord, we say hallelujah, and we don't really mean it. And sometimes it can happen in a charismatic worship time. Yes, we are guilty of that. Matthew 15 and verse 8, the Lord says, you know, uh, these people draw near to me with their lips, but their heart is far away. He says, they're drawing near, but their heart is far away. So we are called to engage in spirit and in truth, right? Whether we are alone or whether we are together. So let's not trade one for the other, saying, I do it at home or, you know, I do it only in church. Let's express, let's draw near because we are priests unto God, okay? Why don't we all stand and, um, um, yeah, um, let's just go before him. You know, at this time, I just want to say, maybe... Sometimes, you know, you've messed up in life, we've done some things, we've made some bad choices, and that's keeping us away. You know, you love the Lord, but the thing is the magnitude of that consequence of that choice is so big, and that shame comes over and over again. And, and we regret it, we are filled with so much condemnation, and on top of that, we're not able to make those right choices. We get into a cycle of sin and defeat and shame and guilt. And you know, this, want, this morning, I just want to remind us that Jesus Christ, that perfect sacrifice, it was made that day on the cross. You know, he gave himself up willingly so that you and I could enter in, so that you and I can have koinonia with him. You know, don't stay far away from the presence of God. You know, run to him. When we read the story of the parable, the parable of the prodigal son, the father runs to the son. While the son is far away off, the father runs. That's the heart of God. This, so this morning, if anything is troubling us, you know, can we lay it before God? Can we say, oh God, 
I'm sorry. The scripture says that he is faithful if we confess our sins. He is faithful to forgive us of all unrighteousness. And as we draw near to God, remember that our identity as new creations is also as priests to God. We come before him to offer up, offer up unto him the spiritual sacrifice. And one of the ways in which we offer spiritual sacrifice is by praising him and giving thanks to him. And we praise him in, praise him in all these wonderful ways. We speak it, we sing it, we shout it, we dance before him, we lift our hands to him, we do it in tongues and many other ways. But let's not be spectators. Let's grow in our expression of praise to God. And we will grow in our expression of praise to God as we walk with him, as our relationship with him you know, uh, increases, as our intimacy with him increases, as he reveals more of himself to us. And that revelation brings us to that conviction. That truth convicts us. And we are able to really set free, really liberated in our expression of praise to him. Amen. Sing like never before Oh my soul Worship His holy name Now let's draw near Let's not worship Him from a distance Let's not be held back, held down by any weights that hinder us Let's draw near to Him The way has been made What are we waiting for? Scripture says, go forth with boldness. Let's draw near to him with boldness. Let's do it like never before. Yes, sing like never before. Oh, my soul and worship his holy name. Yes, I will, I will.
worship your holy name. Now the Hebrew word toda it means thanking him for things not yet received. So we're going to thank the Lord. You know, just go ahead and thank him for things that you've received and thank him for things that you've not yet received and make it a verbal declaration and say, God, I thank you. Oh God, I've been waiting on you for certain things, God, but I thank you because you're a God who heard, oh Master. And I pray in faith, oh God. And Lord, your word says, and when you hear, oh God, and when I know that I've, you've heard, oh God, I have those things for which I've believed, oh God. So I thank you in faith, oh Master. I thank you in faith. You know, let's praise him. Let's praise him. Let's lift our voice. And say, oh God, bless the Lord. This is Toda time. This is Toda time. We're thanking him and saying, God, thanks. Oh God, not yet received, not yet manifested, not yet seen. I am thanking you. I am praising you. you lift your hands why would he say you shout he enjoys our presence hallelujah hallelujah so next Sunday you know you have this in mind just remind the person I'm going to sing like never before I'm going to sing whether I'm on the valley or the top of the mountain I'm going to lift my voice in praise amen because he's worthy of it this is my calling this is our calling this is our role. This is our responsibility. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you a shalom. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord of my soul. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website, apcwo.org, for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.